Now, now, George Franju's Les Yeux Sans Visage, or Eyes Without a Face, made in 1959, is definitely more art house than exploitation, and I cannot praise it enough, and it contains some sumptuous haunting imagery. Go find this one. Anyway, it was this masterpiece of French New Wave that resulted in a few cash-ins, and of course, exploitation rip-offs. These imitations dwelled on the perverse marriage of sex and surgery, and spawned a small legion of imitations of varying quality. Jess Franco gave us Dr. Orloff, which he created in 1962, and the diabolical Dr. Z. These films were primers infusing sex, surgery, and psychod, and which is still going quite strong today, with Orloff often popping up in Franco's films concerning the good doctor, and some are primarily all about this sinful surgeon, or nothing to do with him at all. Like most Franco films, it depends what mood the director was in at the time, God rest his soul. In 1988, we can still see evidence of this in the film Faceless. Out of this contemporary mipic, which is my way of saying mini epic, of fucked up identity and surgical horror set to a cheesier than cheese discotheque soundtrack, and the film Faceless also featured Kojak for those little trivia hounds there. Even as late as um, 2011, Antonio Bandera stars in the film The Skin I Live In, which all harks back to these art house and ex exploitational origins. In the granddaddy of them all though, Les Yeux Saint Visage, Franju captured the essence of melancholy and a visual poetry of sadness, with the main protagonist Edith Scob in a faceless white mask wandering through silhouetted corridors whilst dogs in cages bark and howl into the night. Such images as that haunt you long after the final reel. Franco and the others, well, they tended to go for cheap thrills, really, and swapped visual poetry for viscous pornography. However, if we focus on such an amazing dreamlike atmosphere, this really does set Le Jeux Saint Visage well above the rest of its imitators. Um, Despite this, though, we should not really dismiss the lesser contemporaries as any less genius in their own fields of accomplishment. And considering these were made in the late 1950s, well, Les Vieux's 59 and the early 60s, for example, the awful Dr. Orloff and its successors um, 62 onwards, we shouldn't assume the Gruul and the Grand Guignol is spared either. One such lesser known film, up until now anyway, is the film Corruption, directed by Robert Hartford Davis. And uh, what's also unique about this entry is it's British through and through. It is a movie far grittier than the uh, Hammer or Tygon studios um, that were chucking out films at the time. The formula itself and the staple narrative of this twisted tale can be seen in various movies that resulted in the problematic nasties of the early 1980s. Though never, as far as I'm aware, released on VHS in England, I would imagine back in those terrible times of stoic censorship, it would have made the obscenity list if it was released in its uncut form, a pre-video recordings act back in the day, and it's quite surprising that a movie could be made in the United Kingdom, really, as we are still one of the more censored countries in the Western world, something I feel is a hangover from the Victorian times and still resonates in our DNA today. We Brits are such prudes, although we pretend we are not. Look at the terrible age of verification debacle over pornography nowadays, which is nothing more than prudish provincial attitude disguised in a protect the children overcoat. But back to corruption. In 1967, the press books and posters screamed out that corruption is a super shock film. Corruption is not a woman's picture. 
what can definitely be stated is that we are dealing with one of the most enfant terrible of 1960s horror cinema up until that point, especially for the UK. What the censors at the time worried what the horror genre could evolve into is epitomised in corruption and managed expertly so. Several no-nos in a lit of the film and taboos of the age are boldly flaunted. The prostitution of swinging London is represented, the hedonism of the current youth culture, mad surgeons and violent youth gangs added petrol to flame. For ten years such was corruption's notoriety that it was used as a benchmark on just how vile a, a film can be. Corruption was also an independent production released via a major studio, namely Columbia, that took many a critic off guard. If the film's marketing had boasted Cushing as you've never seen him before, then for once this would be most truthful. Peter Cushing plays a character unlike I have ever seen in any of his other movies, and to see just how warped and twisted his character is and becomes, then always ensure you see the continental or uncut version, which was exported to more liberal markets overseas, and was known under the title Laser Killer. More on that in a bit. So what are the plot? Well, we've got Sir John Rowan, played so eloquently by one of my favourite actors, Peter Cushing. And uh, Sir John Rowan is a wealthy, talented surgeon. John is happily in love with Lynn Nolan, played by the beautiful Sue Lloyd. Remember her from Crossroads? Who is his fiancée and part-time model. Sir John is clearly out of his depth as he is dragged to a swinging 60s winging party. Though Sir John looks ill at ease and his wing has truly lost its ding, he suffers in silence as he will do anything for Lynn. <laughs> Oh, what's a girl like you doing in a place like this, huh? This is John Rowan. Huh? John, this is How do you do? Oh, what's this, This Ray? camera made me famous, sweetheart. John's a surgeon, John. Yeah. At the party, they bump into Mike, played by Anthony Booth, Dathas Dupart's scouse git and disgraceful politician Tony Blair's father-in-law. Mike is quite obnoxious and insists on snapping away at Lynn, much to Sir John's chagrin. When things get a little bit too full on with Mike wanting Lynn to lewd it up in front of the camera, Sir John intervenes. A small fight ensues, one of the lamps used for lighting crashes down on Lynn's face, severely charring the flesh and rendering her scarred for life. Sir John blames himself and uh, carries the cross of this burden of the unfortunate incident. The solution to Lynn's predicament that is slowly impacting on her sanity is a revolutionary laser treatment created by Sir John. It is also established that human pituitary glands are needed as grafts. The pro problem faced, of course, is where to get them from. After using a cadaver for this purpose initially, Sir John feels that something a little warm-blooded is necessary. So he goes about brutally killing a whore and then a woman on a train. These in fact are extremely nasty little vignettes with uh, Peter Cushing giving all he's got in the sleeve stakes and uh, it is rather bewildering because it's a, it's a character that I've never seen him play before and he probably in Frankenstein must be destroyed in the rape scene which is also rather ugly. Um, <clears throat> in these scenes Cushing gives it gusto and he almost salivates as the red stuff is smeared all over the victim's breasts. 
Now this is a marriage of sex and violence that can also be seen in Derek Ford, who wrote the screenplay, um, his other hardcore masterpiece known as Diversions, which was made in 1976. Diversions also uses the methodology of graphic sex coupled with extreme violence, and in this film it is rather jaw-dropping at times. This is a few handful of hardcore pornographic films made by Ford in Kent, England, an upper-class suburban area on the commute about to London in the United Kingdom, home to many snowflakes now and lardy dars for those not familiar with it. This film came about, I mean we're going to get back to um, corruption in a minute, but the film Diversions came about because in the 1970s when Mr Ford and others in the bump and grind field of cinematics anticipated a hardcore, hardcore boom in Britain after Deep Throat in America, which as we were talking about the UK, never actually surfaced. They made these films like this and was hoping that they could be sold to um, great lucrative benefits. The issue there, as we said, it never surfaced indeed because we Brits like our porn neck up and knees down, don't you know? Anyway, back to the movie. In fear of their safety, in light of the killings and in doubt of their sanities, Sir John and the beautiful Lynn head for a remote seaside house as far away from the maddening crowds as possible. However, things take a turn for the worse and their idyllic retreat is shattered because the house that they're in um, ultimately becomes invaded by a group of nasty hippie bikers where John and Lynn find themselves at the mercy of them. One spiteful scene in particular has Lynn held back by force as a brandy glass is placed over her nose and mouth obstructing her airflow to almost pass out. This invasion into Lynn and Sir John's narcissistic environment spirals out of control, ultimately leading to the justifiable apocalypse. <laughs> He did come back! Well, where is she now? I don't know! <laughs> I tell you! I tell you! I tell you! I tell you! Despite its grittiness that was void in Hammer films at the time, I can't help feel that uh, corruption is like a Hammer outcast. Initially sent to obscurity for simply going too far, corruption when initially released caused a negative reaction upon its distribution. One write-up commented, an example of degeneracy to which the cinema can sink in its efforts to satisfy an apparent box office demand for horror and sensationalism. More focus was placed in these reviews on the graphic content than the unusually fresh warts and all approach that the movie had adopted. Bearing in mind all UK audiences were used to at this time was Fang's Bats and the Tepid Guignol of Hammer and um, a bit of tit if you were lucky. Although I'm a big advocate of the Hammer legacy, wonderful, wonderful films, where corruption is concerned, we can see it is in an entirely different sphere, a different breed, to be honest with you. The film is such an intense piece, especially by late 1960s standards, and somehow it seems to echo future Italian nasties, which laid the gruel and misogyny on thicker for the 70s, 80s thrill-seeking audiences, especially towards the end, where the uh, end of the film, where it has a, um, a dalliance with, a, with the home invasion theme. Home invasion films are, are, are pretty nasty pieces of work, to be honest with you, but... Uh, uh, more gruelling pieces would be, um, what came of this would be something like Last House on the Left and House on the Edge of the Park, and the film Hate Crime, which was banned outright in the UK in 2012, and remains in this state to this date by our censors. Thank God for the internet. 
What is most interesting are the two cuts of the film, the standard UK corruption and the infinitely nastier laser killer, the continental version or European cut as it is sometimes deemed. As mentioned previously, this contains some real out-of-character extraordinaire from Cushing. As a true professional, Cushing plays uh, this character um, with, with, with gusto and uh, quite unique as he's played nothing like it before or since. With all the menace and passion as one can find in uh, easily any of his uh, Frankenstein Van Helsing roles. The first instance, of course, as we've mentioned, appears with a prostitute as Sir John leaves his aesthetic surgical utopia for a squalid dive in London. There we meet his first victim, a peroxide stereotypical old hooker. In a gobsmacking sequence, Sir John flips, knocking several bells of shit out of her before producing a huge knife which is used to sever the head from the body. An amazing sequence where Peter Cushing plays the lascivious psychopath with such startling relishness and perversion, it almost engulfs you. The outstanding and frenetic jazz score also adds to the delirium of the whole scene and jaded hedonism witnessed here. The second involves some poor unfortunate woman on a train who receives much of the same treatment and has a corpse stuffed under the seat for good measure. The above uncut footage was denied ever being shot. Why? I am at a loss as there is nothing really embarrassing about these scenes. They are intense, admittedly. It's true to say that Cushing had done nothing like this before and maybe felt the extremity had gone a little too far over his moral boundary. This still seems a shame that the scenes had to be excised as it adds so much to the undertone of decay and destruction caused by narcissism so important to the movie's tone and message. Early references indicate that these sequences were presumed lost. Fortunately, it was only a matter of time before they cropped up in a French subtitled print released on VHS in its laser killer guise. Remarkably, all the nefarious footage was there, and only now has this version been released in an exquisite print courtesy of Grindhouse Releasing. Corruption, until its release on this uh, magnificent Blu-ray disc, seemed uh, to be a lost entry in British cinema, something that was like poo-pooed and swept under the carpet. And uh, what wasn't noticed is that this could have pioneered the way in which horror movies were perceived and executed in the future in the United Kingdom, but it never quite made it. Never to say die, though, as films such as uh, Killer's Moon in 1978, Expose in 1975, and the uncut Satan's Slave in 75, and some of the other Norman J. Warren and Pete Walker vehicles bravely attempted to push the boundaries and catch up with the tone um, of our European counterparts that had achieved decades back. I would confess that uh, despite the fashions and far out man wax lyrical, it could still be considered a lost pioneer. Corruption seems to be an unlucky little gem that never seemed to obtain the attention it so rightly deserved. Whether this is due to copyright, legality, legalities or a victim of downright uh, prudishness, I cannot comment as there is much speculation and very little fact on this subject as to why it wasn't more, more thought of and, uh, and, and, and looked back on as something that had great foresight into what films would become with their grittiness. What I am certain of, though, is that some genre fans are in for a real treat if they dig in their pockets and buy it. Corruption has many nods of what was going to become in terms of notoriety. And most shocking of all, as we also covered in the aspect, you know, earlier on about diversions in pornography, some of this started here in Blighty. I guess we are that backward in, I guess that we aren't that backward in uh, cinematic taboo and dare after all. 
So maybe it's uh, the British public aren't the prudes after all. Maybe, just maybe, it's the ones that govern us that lead us to believe that. dare go home alone after seeing corruption. <laughs> Run. 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 You can't escape the shock, the terror of corruption. She's losing her mind. Have you thought about that? Oh, please, please, we are alone. No, 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 no,